So I'm very happy to, ha to have here uh, Verena uh, Reiser. Uh, she has been an assistant professor in computer science at the Harriet Watt University in Edinburgh since uh, 2011. She previously took postdoctoral research in uh, the School of Informatics at the University of Edinburgh. She holds a PhD summa cum laude. Congratulations. <laughs> Uh, from Sutherland University and an MSc from the University of Edinburgh in 2004. His research is at the intersection of machine learning and natural language processing with applications ranging over multimodal interactions, spot and down systems, and computational sustainability. She serves on two boards for the ACL special interest groups in generation and dialogue, SIGGEN and SIGDIAL. She's currently a visiting researcher at Nuance's research lab in Sunnyvale. I know she also teaches yoga, right? <laughs> <laughs> and also uh, we had a conference in Aruba uh, in 2006, I think, and she won the Limbo contest. So, uh, Due to my yoga skills. <laughs> okay. Also, uh, she has a book on, uh, by, published by uh, Saarbrück and Dissertations in Convention Linguistic and published by the University of Saarland, Saarland University on bootstrapping reinforcement learning based data strategies from Wizard of Oz data. Uh, I guess this is your uh, dissertation, That's right? my dissertation, yeah. 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 Pass it around. For me? Pass it around. I actually, I, I have another book published with Springer, so that's the one, Springer, that's yeah, the I one. I probably have a copy, do I yeah. just grab a copy of this one? Yeah, yeah. The, the, I probably have a copy of the Springer or so. Yeah, the that's yeah. the more recent one, yeah, but yeah. I'm going to come back to that during my talk. But Very good. So. Thanks for coming. Uh, thank you, Roberto. Yeah, yeah. So, um, thank you for the nice introduction and thank you for inviting me. So, I'm currently um, on a sabbatical at Nuance Communications in Sunnyvale. Um, and Nuance Communications, they currently work on conversational interfaces or what people also call um, spoken dialogue systems. Um, so, so this is why Nuance is sort of also part of my affiliations. But as Roberto already said, in my real life, I'm an assistant prof in, um, in Harriet Watt, which is the second biggest university in Edinburgh. And um, my talk today is about optimizing natural language generation for conversational interfaces. And here really the question is um, how a dialogue system or a conversational system should decide on the right output in a specific um, conversational context. So I know that if you work on the input side, so natural language processing, and natural language generation, we work on the opposite. So we are concerned about how, once we assume the dialogue system understood something, um, how should we actually respond and how should we generate? Um, so, and Harriet Watt, I'm part of um, a group which calls itself the Interaction Lab, which is headed by Professor Oliver Lemon. So, we're quite a big group at the moment. We are actually, I think, just over 15 people with three faculty members, including myself, Helen Hasty, and Oliver. And then we've got nine postdocs and about three PhD students. So, um, and we are continuing to grow. So, we've got quite a critical mass there and we are all working in the uh, field of intelligent interfaces, spoken dialogue systems and statistical methods. Um, for the work I'm presenting today especially would like to thank my colleagues, especially Nina Detlefs and um, Oliver Lemon who are co-authors on um, some of the papers I'm presenting today. So um, just a brief outline of my talk for today. So first of all, I give you a very brief introduction to statistical dialogue systems. Um, some of you might already know most of that, but I want to just give you a brief recap. Um, then I'm presenting a novel um, approach to natural language generation, summarizing a few papers of mine. And then finally, um, some, some current applications and future outlooks of this framework. So 
Um, what is a spoken dialogue system? So it's um, always good to start to talk by quoting yourself. So that's the, the book I was talking about. That's the Springer book from 2011 where we describe a spoken dialogue system as a computer agent that interacts with humans by understanding and producing sp uh, spoken language in a coherent way. And this is where it becomes tricky, the in a coherent way bit, because this involves planning and adaptation to the current context and also robustness. And this is why we argue that this is um, a perfect area to apply data-driven machine learning methods. And I hope this argument will become clearer during the course of my talk. So this is one possible architecture of a spoken dialogue system. There are many different out of there, but this is sort of a standard architecture people use. Um, so in the beginning, you've got the user saying something, uttering some waveforms. You probably will all be very familiar with this part, where you use an automatic speech recognizer to transform waveforms into words. So here the user is saying, I'm looking for a cheap restaurant. Then you've got some sort of semantic representation. So here we've got a very simple dialogue act scheme. Um, and we use a semantic parser or a spoken language understanding unit to, um, to get this representation from the words. And then the dialogue manager, which is this big blob over here, is sort of the brain of the system which decides what to do in a given context. So the dialogue act is used to update the context. Also, we keep some history around and some results from the database. And then based of that, the dialogue manager comes up with a strategy of what to do next. So in this case, it comes up with another dialogue act, which is also pretty abstract. And this abstract representation is then fed into natural language generation, which basically needs to decide what to say and how to say it. Um, so the output of natural language generation is a string of words, which then gets transferred or synthesized back to waveforms by um, text to speech. And so far, I've mainly worked on dialogue management and natural language generation, and also a little bit on um, text to speech. So basically, all the, the output components of a spoken dialogue system. So the world's most famous spoken dialogue system is Siri, and you probably all have heard about Siri. Who is actually using Siri in your everyday, day-to-day -day life? Occasionally. Occasionally. <laughs> She's often busy. Oh, is she? The, the, all the recognition is in the cloud. Right. I see. That's actually interesting. Right. Yeah, uh, it, it, it worked quite well. I'm, I'm impressed. Uh, you know, uh, speech recognition is getting better and better. Uh, natural language part is still like uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's very limited, and you don't know the limits, right? Yeah, sometimes. But you know, the nice thing is, it's, it's funny. Sometimes it's funny. Yeah, <laughs> it, it can be funny. Siri can be funny, yeah. and actually, Apple claims that at least in March last year, they published a figure that. 87% of iPhone 4S owners use Siri at least once a month. Um, sort of surprising, but it's, it's an encouraging number for us, at least that people have a positive attitude towards Siri, even though it's not perfect yet. Um, I was going to play you a very brief demo of a naive user using Siri, and that's basically um, what Roberto said, making the same points as Roberto Your said, sound, yeah. that speech recognition is quite good, but there are certain limitations I hope you'll see in the, in the demo. Yeah, no, 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 no. What's the weather like today? There's a weird forecast for today. Where is the closest Burger King? I don't get restaurant matching Burger King. Six of them are fairly close to you. Go on Facebook. Okay. 
sorry, I don't understand. Go on Facebook. Open Facebook. I can't help you with Facebook. Sorry. So, yeah, it's basically, so here the main bottleneck is um, understanding, right? Semantic understanding and keeping ambiguity around. It thinks that Facebook is actually a location the user wants to go to rather than, um, you know, an application. So it's not very robust. Um, also, the way it presented restaurants was probably a bit simplistic, you know, just showing the user a list of restaurants close by. It's not very interactive. It's basically a one-shot dialogue. The user says something, the system provides a one-shot answer, maybe displaying a list. And there's very little real dialogue going on in Siri. However, speech recognition is um, really very good. So I'm, I'm actually using Siri myself. I'm not a native speaker and um, it always, almost always gets it right. So that, that is very encouraging for dialogue people who um, are usually interested in phenomena beyond speech recognition and we are very happy if we get a good speech recognition result. So going back to my talk. Mm -hmm. uh, so the reason why Siri is not very flexible and Act, often acts a bit dumb, it's because it's based on what we call the traditional approach to dialogue engineering. Um, so most dialogue systems nowadays, the ones you use are based on this type of flowchart implementation, where you basically get a bunch of if-then rules, and if a certain threshold, for example, is reached, then the system is doing something. So it's very rigid. And a typical spoken dialogue system contains many hundreds of those flowcharts. Believe me, even very simple systems. I've built some myself, which are not doing not much, but you end up with lots of lines of codes and lots of these little pictures. It's some, you know, in, in the company, was working for probably in the thousands, yeah. thousands of pages. And yeah. was, was and even just maintaining yeah. these flowcharts matched with the code is just um, not a lot of fun. So, um, so the problems with this traditional approach, as we've seen before with Siri, it's very limited in handling uncertainty, especially when, when it comes to semantic uncertainty. It also doesn't really include uh, models of human behavior, so we can't really use information of what the user might be doing next. It also hasn't got any objective measure of goodness. It's basically up to the dialogue um, engineer to come up with a strategy he thinks works well. And there's a limited parameterization of the decision logic, meaning when you end up in one node, you only have a certain number of parameters you can actually use making your decision. Um, as a result, um, the development is manually very expensive and it's really hard to maintain a system and even harder to transfer it to a new domain or to a new language. So you basically have to, scratch, uh, have to start from scratch every time you build a new system. Um, also, the systems are quite fragile, especially in noisy conditions. Um, and it's unable to adapt either short-term or long-term. Short-term, I mean it's unable to adapt to a rich dialogue context, and long-term, I mean it's unable to adapt to a certain user, for example, to a certain user profile. So as a, um, as a reply to these limitations, people have turned to statistical approaches to spoken dialogue systems. So in the two main research area at the moment in, in this general domain, one is belief monitoring or belief tracking. People also call it belief tracking, which is often done using partially observable mark of decision processes. So for example, Steve Young's group in Cambridge is um, working on this very intensively and also um, Jason Williams and now in Microsoft Research is doing a lot of work on that. And then there's a second big um, area which is action selection or policy optimization. So what to do next. And this is often using reinforcement learning. And then there was a very early paper by Roberto in 1997 who actually introduced this idea. And then over the time, many other people um, started to pick up this framework. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> the, the German spelling. <laughs> Um, right, and this talk will be mainly about um, policy optimization. So to give you a very quick idea what policy, policy optimization for stochastic environments is about, so we usually formulate a dialogue context as a state in a certain time. So here at time t minus 1, and in this dialogue context, the system ought to make a decision what to do next. So in this case we've got a dis we've got an action a1 which is to ask how many do you want or an action a2 which is to ask do you want three so how is the system going to decide between these two actions so it looks into what it thinks could be possible futures so it asks a um, user model or user simulation what do you think the user is most likely to reply and here we've got a certain probability that the user mumbles something or that the user actually says three. And these user actions will then create a new dialogue context, which is state one at time, uh, yeah, state one at time one, that should be one. And also these states are then associated with a measure of goodness. So this is a reward the system gets in the end. So here, when, this use, when the user mumbles something, we have a negative reward. But if the user replies with something eligible and actually useful, we get a positive reward. So these rewards are getting propagated back from the end of the dialogue. So at the end of the dialogue, we can measure wh whether the task was successful or not. And this is how we can propagate back these rewards. Similar for the, for the other action, we look into the future. What do we think the possible um, uh, transition probabilities for a user saying something would be? So here we've got a high probability that the user actually says something useful, so we get a high reward, and a low probability for the user to um, do something bad, in this case hanging up. So this is something we really want to avoid. So in order to make this decision here, we're going to compute all these possible future rewards and then make an informed decision about this trade-off. So in general, we can think about making a decision in a certain context as a trade-off problem. Um, so, oh, so this type of mechanism or decision tree is also called a Markov decision process. So in this case, the states are fully observable, meaning that we actually know what's in our context and the partially observable Markov decision process I was mentioning earlier, those approaches would keep a distribution over states, it's meaning that the whole problem becomes even more um, difficult to solve. But let's stay with the Markov decision model for now. Um, these kind of models, so this trade-off problem, can be solved using reinforcement learning um, so reinforcement learning is often used in robotics. This is why we've got our little robot agent over here. And this agent ought to take actions in an environment. Um, so in the environment reacts in an uncertain way. So the agent doesn't know for sure if it takes an action, how will this environment react. It can only observe after taking an action the new state of this environment and getting a reward, similar to what we've seen before. And in order to um, optimize it, its actions, it's doing the circle over and over and over again until it can actually compute this Q function. So it's also called the Bellman optimality equation, which is a well-known function Bellman introduced in 1952. And reinforcement approaches are basically approximations to solve this Bellman equations. And this Bellman equation says there's a, a policy pi over all possible states and actions which computes the sum over all possible future rewards. Remember the rewards were propagated back um, plus a discount factor how far we actually look into the future. For dialogue systems we typically want to look quite far into the future because we, we really care about a successful outcome of the dialogue, give them a transition function. So the transition function we get from these probabilities between states, which we typically learn from, from data. 
Right. Um, any questions so far? So that was the general introduction on, on the background. Um, if not, I'm going to go on to um, stochastic output generation. So that's the area I'm currently interested in. So reinforcement learning for dialogue management is currently regarded to be pretty much state of the art, at least for research based uh, dialogue management. There are a lot of publications over the past, let's say, 10 years. And it's even rumored to feature in the next series. Let's see what, what, what Siri will do next, what unexpected behavior we'll so get from Jamal that. Said that. Yes, he yeah. said that in a, I think it's even in a paper in um, MSP 2012. So, um, I think I have a patent on that. I should probably. Yeah, you should file it. <laughs> <laughs> get, get Apple. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, so this is all really positive and encouraging for us. However, natural language generation has never been formulated as a reinforcement learning problem before, and we think it should. And in the next couple of slides, I'm going to argue why I think it's a reinforcement learning problem. So um, let's assume the user just asked something. I'm looking for Italian restaurant in Berkeley. And then the dialogue manager um, decides what to say. So it sets the communicative goal. So here it's a very abstract representation of percent cuisine equals Italian and location equals Berkeley, right? So the energy module's job is then to decide how to say it. So it could say something like, I found 17 restaurants in Berkeley which serve Italian food. That's one possible option. Could also say there are several restaurants in Berkeley several Italian restaurants in Berkeley, sorry. Or it could say Berkeley offers a wide range of Italian restaurants. So there are a multitude of options this module needs to decide on. So there's a one-to-many mapping between the abstract dialogue act or communicative goal and um, the words you could use to, to actually convey this information to the user. So how to make this decision? So this depends on different value functions or different goals you have in your system. So for example, you could ask how to choose to make it sound better. So let's assume you have a TTS system, which is not very good. So you might want to choose the words which can actually be pronounced by the TTS system. So that's a paper we had in Interspeech or in order to be more efficient. So if you want to actually convey the information to the user very rapidly, or very quickly, or um, in order for the user to, to complete the task, because natural language generation, the way you actually say something might influence how well the user actually is able to perform um, its ta his task. So this choice mechanism and these end rewards make us believe that energy should be formulated as an optimization task. Um, so in, um, in work we presented in ESL 2009, we declared spoken dialogue syst uh, natural language generation for interactive systems as a sequential hierarchical planning problem in a stochastic environment, environment which can be solved using reinforcement learning. And um, so this is one possible formulation of natural language generation, especially for interactive systems. So if we compare that with the more traditional approach for, for natural language generation, which um, I quote from the sort of classic textbook from Wright and Dale from 2000. So the traditional view of natural language generation is a translation task. So you take non-linguistic representation uh, not a non-linguistic representation of information and you want to translate it into human language. So this is almost like the reverse of parsing if you see it like that. Whereas for interactive systems, because we've got so many ways to actually um, formulate something, and we, we declare it to be a plan, to plan a sequence of actions to achieve a communicative goal. Because in an interactive systems, what you really care for is that the user actually reaches or fulfills his task. Then again, um, the aim of 
the more traditional view is to replicate human written texts. So you take human written text and you declare it to be the gold standard and you want to replicate the human written text, which by the way usually calls for a supervised learning approach. And um, in an interactive system what we really want to do by formulating things in a certain way is to manipulate an uncertain environment for example, the user's reaction. So what we really care for is the way the user actually reacts to what we just said. Yes, please. Yeah, this may be too soon to, to ask you this, but all of this is involved in selecting a, a plans from a set of actions. So where does the space of actions come from? Yeah, that's a good, that's, that's, that's a very good question. So this, again, is data-driven, and this is, again, um, sort of related to replicating human written text because what you want to do ideally you want to for example if you want to learn how to present restaurants right you for example get a corpus of different ways users describe um, restaurants and then you formulate different choice points so for example some users uh, 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 oh okay so you have a corpus yes okay so you yeah. can tell us that yet. not yet no okay. no that, that helps. Go ahead. Yeah, so basically the corpus, because if okay. you ask someone to, to formulate something in a certain way, people will come up with all sort of different formulations. Okay. So, yeah, I have another question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, uh, the, another way to do that, the, the, the right part in, in interactive, is to uh, design different ways to do, like we, we used to do in the industry, right? So we have these people called UI designers who design the wording of the prompts. And one way that we try to use an enforcement learning there to design multiple prompts for the same state yep. and then find out with data. Uh, and we found, actually everyone knows in, in the industry that the, the, just changing the way you word the prompt can cause the failure or the success of a system, yep. right? Are, are you, are you that, looking into that too? Yeah, yeah, so that actually was also one surprising outcome from yeah. the results I will present in the very end that actually the, the wording does influence task success. And that was something we were sort of surprised that it really, it wasn't only the dialogue management decision, it was really how you formulate yeah. a certain action. Yeah. Good, yeah. something that you talk about. Yeah, yeah. 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 that's um, actually good that you mentioned that. It gives me a little advertisement for the, my end good. results. <laughs> So, um, so coming back to this idea, so this is more replicating human written text and this is more making a choice. So this is also reflected in the main approaches people have used for machine learning for natural language generation. So machine learning for natural language generation is around um, since 1998 roughly by a paper by Langkyle and Knight. And then many approaches followed all using um, supervised learning. And then a little bit later on, people actually looked into reinforcement learning and also game theory. Actually, one of your colleagues here in Berkeley had a paper in 2010, I think, using game theory, um, Dan Klein, on, um, on natural language generation. So this is basically, um, and then there are people also using a combination between supervised learning and reinforcement learning. So the areas, supervised learning is, is mainly concerned with surface realization. So natural language generation is a pipeline which sort of starts with content selection and what people call micro planning. So that's, for example, text structure planning, text pla uh, sentence planning, whether you combine something into a sentence and re referring expression generation. Surface generation is really mainly concerned with choosing the words in a sentence. And the higher level, the reinforcement learning in game theory is often um, used for content selection and micro planning, so the more higher level decision. So for example, I think Dan, Klein pa Dan Klein's paper was about referring expression generation. And then there are people looking into um, joint optimization between the higher level and the lower level NLG decisions. And they typically use a combination between supervised learning and reinforcement learning. So just to give you an overview of the general um, landscape. So now I'm going into a brief case study where I also describe how we learn this actually from data. 
So here we had the problem of information presentation for a spoken dialogue system. So in our, our task was to help the user find a restaurant. So that was part of my postdoc work I did at the University of Edinburgh for the classic project. Um, so here we could say in order to help the user find a restaurant, what a typical dialogue system does is to ask the user something like, I found more than 500 results, could you give me some other piece of information? And this is actually a quote from a system. So systems really do that. And then the user ought to come up with something like, yeah, I want a cheap Chinese restaurant or whatever. Um, it would be much more helpful to actually explain to the user what his options are. So for example, you could say, I found several Italian restaurants in Berkeley. Most of them are in walking distance and are reasonably priced. Gypsy Stratatoria has the highest ranking in, in Yelp. So you give the user something to work with rather than just asking him lots of questions and assuming that he already has his goal formulated in his head. So here we assume that the user actually doesn't know yet what, what he wants. And this is, um, so this approach is called collaborative response generation. Um, there are a few papers from uh, Lynn Walker and Joseph Polifroni and Vera Demberg and China Moore on that. Um, so we basically took these existing approaches and what we found is that these descriptions can get awfully long. And also the question is, which attributes should you actually include when you talk about um, a restaurant. So should you rather talk about walking distance or the price? Maybe the user doesn't care about the price. So how do you actually determine which content to put into these collaborative summaries and whether you should actually summarize or compare restaurants or maybe just recommend one? So that was basically our option space. So. Um, we wanted to solve the trade-off problem between information gain, so how much more information does the user get from a prompt versus the length, how, how much can he actually take in, especially when it's TTS generated. And the choices of optimization were what items to present to the user and how to present them, so this is what we call the energy strategy selection, and then which and how many attributes to choose, so that's the attribute selection bit. And the uncertainty we modeled in the environment was the user reaction. So that's similar to dialogue management, where we can't really predict what the user says next as a reply. But we also modeled um, uncertainty from lower level components. So for example, we used a sentence planning tool. Um, sorry, that's my email. <laughs> it's not the fire alarm or anything. Um, so we used a sentence planning tool which basically used a stochastic model. So we got some uncertainty in terms of sentence length because that was uh, automatically um, determined and also in terms of lexical choice and TTS quality. So these were all things we, um, we didn't know for sure how a decision, a high up decision would actually be realized in lower level components. So um, to, in order to formulate the decision space, um, we looked into uh, strategies people have used in previous research. So people have looked into summarizing restaurants, comparing restaurants, and typically what dialogue systems do is just to, to pick the top ranking one and recommend that to the user. And there's also interesting work in how to combine these strategy, strategies. So we, um, so for example, you could first summarize your items and then you could recommend one. In order to actually generate this, we've used the Sparky generator by Amanda Stent. Um, so this is how you, how you basically get the surface forms here. Um, to give you a quick idea of how it sounds, so this is a system I built with my um, colleague and friend Alex Greenstein when he did visit Edinburgh in 2009. So that's a system he built for his PhD at MIT, which is an online system for a multimodal online system. And um, I've built some generation on top. And in this case, there's some out multimodal output generation and uses a um, freely available list database of 
Edinburgh restaurants. And just to give you a quick idea how that works. Right, so in this case, the system just recommended a top rank, top ranking restaurant and sort of displayed the results on the screen. And as you can already hear, the text to speech is a little bit hard to understand. So this is where the trade off problem comes in. How much information do I actually present? How much can the user actually process before he gets bored? Um, yeah. Um, it's a good question. I'm not sure what, what he used. No, no, it's not festival. It's something which was hosted at MIT. So the whole VAMI system is sort of the ASR and the TTS is, ho is hosted. And you just, um, it's, it's, it's sent somewhere. And I'm, I'm also pretty sure it's not festival, but I can't tell you. <laughs> it usually now also comes with a Scottish voice. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, sorry, you're from New Orleans, aren't you? Well, I'm, I'm visiting. I'm visiting now. <laughs> so, yeah, so just to give you an idea what the system actually sounds like. Um, so, again, so we now wanted to optimize the output generation and the choice points were which strategy to use in which context and how to combine them. So, the maximum the system could do was to first summarize the items then compare them and then recommend them. So that would be the maximum the system could do. And then with, with these individual strategies, which attributes to choose to actually talk about, whether you talk about price, location, um, service quality, what else did we actually have? I think we had five in total. Um, service quality, I think there was also some sort of user rating and, or, and, and things like that. So there were mostly um, quanti qu qualitative um, descriptions of the restaurants we got from this online database. So, um, so when we formulated... Yeah. What were the contexts? Context. Oh, the context. So that's actually described in the state space. That's what I'm talking about in a minute. Oops. So, Basically, in order to describe a context for, for optimization, you need to formulate the state space. So that's what I've been talking before when we formulated it as a Markov decision process. The context is described in a state, and then from the state, you ought to make certain decisions. So in this case, you ought to first select the IP strategy, the information presentation strategy, and then the specific attributes. So this is why it's um, hierarchical. And the state space in this case, so we monitor the utterance length. So how much actually did we generate so far? Um, so this varies from the, um, from the stochastic uh, realizer, the sparky realizer. Then the user's preferences, which varies, the number of database items we want to present, and the expected user reaction. So the expected re user reaction we get from our internal user model. Um, so the IP strategy, as I said before, could either be summarize, compare, recommend, or then a combination of those. And the user-specific attributes we got from our ordered list. So we assumed we already knew the user type. So we knew whether the user um, was a starving student, for example, and he really wanted to find a cheap restaurant. So we just, for, we just assumed we already knew that because there's lots of other wor work which actually looks into user adaptation. And even though that looks like a fairly simple problem, we end up with very big state spaces, over 400 um, K of states and three to the power of five actions. So it's a big problem to optimize. And the problem with reinforcement learning is, as I showed you before, you need to go through the cycle of taking actions and observing the environment over and over again to actually estimate your Q function. So we can't really ask real users to do that, um, especially when the system is doing random choices. 
So what we did, we were learning in a safe simulated environment where our system could do all sorts of unsafe actions without the user getting annoyed. So the way we actually got our simulated environment was to first um, conduct a Wizard of Oz study. So the advantage of a Wizard of Oz study is that you can start without having built a system because you have a human pretending to be a system and the user um, usually doesn't know that he's actually interacting with a other human being, he still thinks um, he's interacting with a system. And in the end, you get user ratings, so you know whether the, the wizard's action was actually good or bad. So in this case, we were actually really interested in the wizard as a subject as well, because we wanted to know different ways different wizards were actually formulating um, a reply. So we analyzed basically different ways wizards would reply to a user request and this was our initial corpus which we then used for, for generation. How did you provide information to the wizard? He had a search interface so it was almost um, halfway of building a dialogue system. So it was basically everything the system would see, the wizard does see. So that he would actually hear what the user said so we didn't have a um, semantic transcription, but then he would query the database and um, be able to type back to the user. And he could also drag and drop um, templates if it was too slow for him to reply. So the standard reply is like, hello, how may I help you? He could just press buttons. And then when it came to the interesting bit, to the information presentation bit, we asked him to actually type. And then the user would hear TTS generated output. For the wizards, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, so this was sort of the the overall setup. Um, so you first collect wizard of OS data, you build a simulated environment, you train and test in simulation, then you also test with real users to actually see whether what you've learned makes any sense. And then you hopefully can show that the results transfer. So what you've showed in simulation, you can also verify with real users. Um, so for the results in simulation, uh, we found that, um, so we only looked at basically, first we only looked at the information presentation strategy, so whether to com recommend, compare or sum summarize and on certain combinations. So that's what we found the baseline, so all the different combinations we found in previous systems and the optimized strategy um, outperforms that. By the way, the, um, the reward function here is just um, a linear regression model on the Wizard of Oz data. So we got the user scores and the, the wizard behavior, and then we, we got the reward function by calculating that. Am I reading this wrong? Random was better? Yes, random was actually doing quite well. So basically, random choice between um, all of those baseline was, was doing quite well and we think it was for the variety that the users just got bored but always hearing a summary. I see. That's really interesting actually. Yeah, so one, one lesson to be learned is that you don't want to be repetitive when you do natural language generation. So always doing the same thing is really bad. Being random is actually not that bad as long as you've got an interesting action space, right? So as long as you don't include any ludicrous action choices, you can actually do quite well. And I'm, I'm not sure if you also found that in your um, systems. Uh, we had some very, very, very low level of random, you know, randomization in the prompts. Uh, but uh, one thing that I don't think I, we ever tried, but uh, would be interesting to, to be able to characterize the user in some, some way. Yeah. And I believe that you can get it a little bit better performance if you know, you know, for instance, we had, uh, actually we had a way, interesting way to characterize users. User call during the night were different than user call during yeah. the day. Because <laughs> it was a highly technical thing, you know, troubleshooting of internet. People during the day were people with a uh, home, yeah. people with, you know, uh, uh, young kids or people with, with uh, you know, older, older age people. people. And yeah. while, you know, the, uh, uh, you know, intermediate, you know, more technically yeah, uh, yeah, uh, uh, savvy, yeah, yeah. Uh, where 
calling during the night. Yeah, yeah so that's uh, yeah. Uh, that's interesting. And if we can did that. We did a switch. Uh, which time they are calling? Yeah. To, to change the strategy, the prompting strategy. Yeah. Then you have an estimation of user yes. type, whereas we yeah. we didn't really yeah. know what user yeah. type we were dealing with. So when we were actually then optimizing for both strategy and attribute selection, we compared it against the wizard behavior. So we sort of extracted what the wizards did, the average wizards. They were all basically, by the way, rate, rated quite similarly by our users. So there was no wizard which did really bad in this situation. Um, so we learned sort of an average, average strategy of what the wizards did and compared that with our optimized function. So here we optimized it for the users don't really want to hear too many data, to hear about too many database items. The sentences should be quite short and you want to optimize for user reaction. So you want to actually get the user to choose one. And um, we did significantly outperform the, this baseline as well. So um, testing with real users then was again interesting because um, so we used we integrated it into the PomDP based uh, system by Cambridge and we did a mechanical Turk evaluation and we found actually as I said advertised before that we did get a 30% in increase in dialogue task completion compared to um, the hand coded strategy they used in the Cam Cambridge Info System, which um, again was sort of unexpected that natural language generation can actually have such a big impact on NLG. However, what was also interesting was that the subjective user scores did not show any differences. So the users didn't really care or they did, couldn't really tell whether the system was doing different things. And we think one reason for that was actually that um, the speech recognition was quite bad for our systems, especially the Mechanical Turk setup. And the, even so, we used a PomDP-based system. User were calling in on Skype. We didn't really restrict it to only native speakers. We had horrendous uh, word error rates. So that sort of over, was overriding um, any user effects we could really, um, any user scoring effects we could really observe. Could have you tried uh, with text instead of speech? Yeah, we could, we, we could have done that, even though we, we did a joint evaluation. We were also interested in the POMDP approach, so this is why we used yeah, speech. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so, so far, just a brief wrap up before I finish my talk. So we had promising results for quite simple recommender systems so far. And um, I'm happy to say that also other researchers have been exploring this model. Um, so now a very brief outlook of how to make this more um, exciting. So applications and future directions. So what I'm currently working on is incremental systems for real time interaction. So incrementality uh, was introduced by Schlangen and Skans in 2009. And at the moment, a lot of European projects are on incremental dialogue systems. I've noticed not so much in America, but in, in Europe, it's very, um, it's a big movement, incrementality. Um, and then, can you define oh, what, is an, what an incremental dialogue system is? Yeah, I'll show you actually oh, okay, yeah. a um, example in a minute. So then, also we wanted to imp to um, use this uh, strat um, framework in com in in more complex domains with rich semantics, so going beyond restaurants really, and then also multi-party interaction if you've got more than one user. So the first. Um, topic is part of a project called Parlons. So again, one of these big European projects. And this is what we define as incrementality. So it's basically where the system can barge in incremental generation where the system can barge in over the user. So it can actually say something before the user has finished talking. So normally in no the conventional spoken dialogue system, the system sort of measures with a threshold when the user didn't say anything for a while and then it formulates its reply. But in an incremental system, as soon as the user starts speaking, the whole chain starting from you know, natural language understanding, di dialogue management and natural language generation, will start computing possible outputs at every, time, at every 
uh, unit, basically, the user says something. Um, so here the user says, I need an Italian restaurant that is located dot, dot, dot. And then the system barge in and says, I'm sorry, did you say Indian or Italian? So it was really not sure what the user just said. So instead of waiting, it immediately tries to clarify. And then the user was able to clarify. Um, that's a paper we had in EMLP last year. Do the user get annoyed by that? That's what we tried to find out. Because I was also thinking, like, hmm, I'm not sure whether I would want Siri to barge in on top of me. It's a bit rude, isn't it? So in order to, um, to optimize that, we actually looked into information, information density for barge-ins. So the idea was that you can, that this is more acceptable if the system barges in before an information peak um, than after an information peak. So what is an information peak and what is information density? So it's a concept from, from information theory, and it has also been shown to actually influence human language production. So what it actually is, it's a log over the probability of an utterance, which is nothing else but the sum of um, the log of one word following the probability of one word following the other, which is nothing more than an n-gram language model, really. And what we found, not surprisingly, that information peaks occurs, occur at keywords and not at filler words, because keywords are less frequent than filler words. And we integrated that as part of the reward function, and we had baselines where um, one baseline was barging in after an information peak and one baseline was barging in at random points. So here we could actually significantly outperform the baseline, the random baseline even. Um, and we also then ask real users to evaluate um, what they think is the most appropriate point for a barge in. And option one was the learned, op uh, sorry, option two is the so that should, yeah, so option one is the, the learn policy, option two is baseline one, and option three is baseline two. And here we found that for the human rating, we actually get the opposite effect. So the learn policy is still outperforming the baseline. However, the random baseline is doing quite well again, because the way it barges in at random points, some users find it annoying, some users don't find it that annoying. So again, we've got this effect of um, individual preferences from the users, which is hard to control yeah, I, for. I, I want to say something funny. Uh, a speech cycle, we implemented for a short time a, a version of our system that uh, when an important, you know, user barging, users barging, are always allowed to barge in. When an important informational prompt was played and a user barge in, we were uh, starting the prompt again by saying, uh, I'm trying to say something important. <laughs> Listen to me. And then <laughs> we, people freaked out. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they didn't like that at all? Yeah, no. no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's a whole interesting research area about politeness and spoken yeah, dialogue well, systems. Uh, <laughs> uh, this gets into all cultural uncanny valley. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> cultural specific yeah, maybe polite, as well. Yeah. So and then a very brief advertisement, more than a summary about the last two um, points, the complex domains and the multi-party interaction. So here we, um, I'm part of a project um, which is called Stack. It's a big, it's an ERC fellowship for Nicholas Asher, who is um, at Paul Sabatier in Toulouse at the moment, and Alex Lascarides in Edinburgh. And what we use here, um, don't know if any of you recognize this. This is a board game. Some people laugh. Um, it's very popular in Germany. It's called Settlers of Catan, and this is the J Settlers, the online version of it. So basically, it's a bit like civilization, where you need to um, build houses and settlements and roads. And in order to do that, you need to trade resources. So what we are really interested in are these trading dialogues, because they can actually be non-cooperative. So here's where the strategic interaction comes in of how people get you to trade with, that, with, with you, even though it might not be um, optimal for them. 
And um, here's an example from the corpus we collected. So A says, anyone got rock? And B says, I've got lots of wheat, but in fact, B has rock. And C just decides to stay silent. So that's another way of um, hiding information. And the interesting bit from um, a semantic point of view, so that what uh, Alex Lascarides and Nick Asher are also very interested in, is the um, implication. So in a co cooperative setting, following the Christian maxims, you would be able to imply from B's utterance that he doesn't have any rock, right? However, in, in this non-cooperative setting, B might, has, uh, might as well have rock. And actually, in our corpora, he was actually hiding the fact that he has rock. So now we need to actually move from, a, from binary implication saying, yes, uh, I have rock, or no, I don't have rock, to a probability that you've got rock. And this is where it becomes interesting for us, dealing with uncertainty and dealing with probabilities. So basically, um, so cooperati co cooperating with um, rich symbolic representation of discourse provided by us, by Alex and, uh, and Nick, we are doing the, um, what we call opponent modeling for multi-party dialogue, where we try to estimate the probability of someone actually lying to us. Um, and this is this is ongoing work. Um, yeah. Sorry, I'm just saying that's a really interesting application to, to pick because the domain is very limited, but the richness of the dialogue is, is really high. Yeah. yeah so that's really the, the, the interesting corpus to look at. Yeah, we we get really interesting corpora, I have to say, and 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 very different user types, and it's yeah. really fun to look at the data. Um, but actually, the domain is very difficult to model. So Nick Asher is doing, tries to do settlers with game theory mm -hmm. to just solve the game problem, and it's it's very hard. <laughs> so uh, future challenges. So at the moment, we're doing the simulation-based learning. Obviously, it would be much nicer to do online learning that the system actually learns while it's talking to the user. Um, then there's also what we call the curse of dimensionality. So the more complex domains, the more complex state spaces, the more complex actions, um, the harder it is to actually learn anything from limited amounts of data. And then um, um, partially observable mark of decision processes, POMDPs, are very attractive, um, especially when you deal with speech. But at the moment, they only work for small toy domains. Um, for example, Cambridge had the system who was doing pizza ordering over years and years and years, and it's just not progressing to any more complex dialogue domains for the, for the same problem, the curse of dimensionality. And then also this idea of whether you can integrate this idea with commercial systems, and that's um, what I'm currently trying to find out. I'm here on a research stay at Nuance. Um, as probably Roberto knows, there's lots of resistance from industry actually using this yeah. uh, technology, ma mainly because they don't have control over what the system is. Yeah, but we, 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 we uh, you know, specifically, we, we, we use something limited, just selecting a few states where we, and, and we had highly, you know, highly controls by the customer. The customer really wanted to know what yeah. was going on, but we did some, something like that. But it's, it's very difficult. Yeah, yeah. So Roberto's. Uh, company was actually the first one who did that on a big scale, actually really putting it out there to, to use this and see what they do. Yeah. So yeah, so ideally we want to get them out of our uh, academic lab laboratories and um, apply them with lots of lots of people. So um, just a quick summary. So Statistical methods are now state of the art for spoken dialogue system. I presented a new model for natural language generation, and I've briefly talked about information presentation for recommender systems, efficient incremental systems, and then I gave a brief outlook for rich semantic domains, this strategic communication in the stack project. And yep, um, this model is also, be, is also explored by other researchers at the moment, which is great for us. And if you want to um, know more about it, um, that's the Springer book I was talking about from 2011. Um, that's a bit blurry. So that's a book which came out of the classic project, which summarizes 
or the results. So Steve Young has a few articles. Roberto has an article in yeah, there, I, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. and um, um, Olivier Piedcar, who also is a big player in this area. And that's a book about empirical methods and natural language generation, which also features this approach. And that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much. And I'm sorry I went over time a bit. It was a very interesting talk. Uh, any more questions?